Hi, friends. Hi, and thanks for joining us. Our, it looks like we're filling into the room here. Awesome. Nice to see you. Hello and welcome from Crow Canyon. I'm Adam Caxbetter, and I work for Crow Canyon as a cultural explorations coordinator, facilitating high quality educational experiences, <clears throat> excuse me, for some of our yearly offerings of travel seminars that take place over the American Southwest and the world. As many of you likely know, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center is a nonprofit organization based in Southwest Colorado. Our mission is to make the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Crow Canyon staff are actively working on this mission right now by conducting and sharing research, creating educational opportunities like this webinar, and working with our Native American partners to appropriately share indigenous knowledge. You can support us in our mission by going to our website at crowcanyon.org and clicking on the support Crow Canyon button. Also, please check out our YouTube channel to see more uh, free webinars like this one. Thank you for your support and we hope that you enjoy today's webinar. We want, to be, we want this to be interactive, so please submit questions. Those of us watching this live session should see a button on the screen that says Q&A, uh, where you can type in your questions, and then I'll compile your questions and try to get you some answers after Steve's presentation. I'm going to turn things over to Steve, uh, but please first allow me to uh, tell you a little bit about him. Steve and his family have been friends of Crow Canyon for many years. And I, am cer I certainly have enjoyed getting to know him over the last six months while planning a custom tra travel seminar with Twofold Handcrafted Travel. I have heard nothing but good things about this kind and generous man. Steve owns Twin Rocks Trading Post and Cafe in the charming town of Bluff, Utah. Twin Rocks got its name from, a lo from its location underneath two very impressive sandstone formations known as hoodoos. Steve is an active promoter and supporter of the arts and now runs his businesses full time. He's an advocate for local business and the nearby Bears Ears National Monument. He's a volunteer board member for the Friends of Cedar Mesa, sits on three other boards, and is the head wrestling coach for San Juan High School. His wife, Georgiana, is an art teacher and a cross-country coach for Whitehorse High School within the Navajo Nation. And they are both proud of their two children who are pursuing careers as an astrophysicist and a biomedical engineer. Steve has been involved with the arts a long time and is considered an expert in his field. We are very excited for him to share his knowledge with us in the realm of Navajo basketry and how this extraordinary art form has evolved over time. Without further ado, I now turn it over to our scholar, Steve Simpson. Hi, Steve. Hi, Adam. Hi, Sarah. Well, as Adam said, my name is Steve Simpson. I am the owner of Twin Rocks Trading Post, which um, is a uh, small business in Bluff, Utah that was formed a little over 30 years ago. Um, and we are engaged uh, in close, re close relationships, close artistic relationships with the Navajo people, um, the Ute people, the Hopi, the Santa Domingos, and many, many Southwestern tribes. Um, when Twin Rocks was open in 2018, I'm sorry, 2000, in 1989, um, we generally formed the philosophy of, of working closely with the artist to create new artistic movements that incorporated the historic elements of what the, uh, what the tribal members had been doing and then infuse them with um, innovative elements so that the art was dynamic instead of um, static. And it's been generally an amazing 30 years to, to, uh, of working very, very closely with the artists. Um, at the time Twin Rocks was, was opened its doors, the, well, let me just say that our primary focus is Navajo baskets. And that's what we have staked our reputation on and what we are most well known for. Um, and in 1989, when Twin Rocks Trading Post opened its stores, generally what you saw was uh, or were ceremonial baskets. And those are the baskets that are used in healing ceremonies of many varieties and wedding ceremonies. And it tends to have, if we can, we'll do a little show and tell. And as I mentioned to Adam previously, 
Um, if you have questions, just submit them. And I just generally do show and tell, and I don't mind being uh, stopped at any point. So this is the standard um, ceremonial basket design, <clears throat> which again would be used in uh, any number of healing ceremonies and then also wedding ceremonies. So it's um, the generic reference is as a ceremonial piece. Um, it has uh, deep meaning. It's used in many aspects of uh, Navajo daily life. Um, aside from being used by medicine men, it's also used as a container for, um, for people's uh, jewelry or fetishes um, of their herds because the, the basket is believed to have the power to um, accentuate and to help grow uh, an individual's wealth and then their herds. <clears throat> the, there are a number of stories that relate to the ceremonial basket. Some are relatively simple, saying the, the, the black portions here are mountains and these are clouds and this is a rainbow. Um, the, the story I like best, um, which I heard for the first time uh, probably 25 years ago, is that the ceremonial basket is a map of one's life. And that when you enter the world, when you're born into this realm, uh, you come through this opening and then you begin to spiral along your pathway. Uh, and as you spiral out, you're growing and changing. And when you get out here to where you start seeing a little bit of the black woven into the basket, that represents beginning to gain knowledge, but also understanding that there is some adversity, some difficulty in life. Um, and that grows as you progress out. And then you get into this area, the, the, the blood, what are referred to as the blood rings, and that represents marriage and family and uh, blending the blood of uh, your blood with the blood of your spouse and having children. And then as you progress out of that, you notice that the black begins to dissipate. And again, that represents the gaining of knowledge and learning how to cope with some of these adversities that you run into. And then you get out here into the all white area, which represents the spiritual realm um, where there's no difficulty. Um, and then this area, this uh, area right here, which is referred to as the spirit wine or the weaver's pathway, represents the ideal that um, no matter where you are in that process, there's always a pathway to the light, to the spirit world. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very important uh, aspect. It's a very important element in Navajo culture and Navajo daily life. Um, the baskets are, are typically um, universally almost woven of sumac, which is a local plant that grows along the water courses and, and washes and that sort of thing. Its uh, scientific name is Rus trilobata or three leaf Rus. Um, and if you're from the East, you might know sumac, poison sumac. This is a different type. Um, and the weavers over the past several years have had more and more difficulty obtaining the sumac for their basketry because of development or people closing off uh, the areas where they harvest the willows. <clears throat> what we have done at Twin Rocks is um, <clears throat> beginning uh, 30 years ago, uh, we started talking to the artists about how could we begin to develop a local economy that would um, benefit their personal economies, that would raise their standard of living. And in order to do that, um, we, in conjunction with the, with the local Navajo artist, developed an idea that if we did more creative, unusual basketry, that people might support them a little more financially and they could make a better living. And as it turned out, that's exactly what happened. In the early stages of the development, um, they, what, the Nav what the local Navajo weavers were doing and what we were um, encouraging them to do was sort of take Southwest um, style basketry 
and blend the elements. So uh, in, the, in some of the earliest baskets, you would see Hopi designs combined with Apache elements. Um, and it was, it, it was really very interesting. And we generally refer to that as the cu cross-cultural phase. <clears throat> and then at some point, it shifted into the imagery became Navajo. And um, it, in our experience, that happened when Mary Holiday Black, who is the matriarch of contemporary Navajo basketry, brought a, um, a, a fire dance basket into the trading post. And what she had done is, is taken symbolism from the mountain chant, which is also known as the fire dance, it's a very important, almost extinct ceremony in the Navajo culture, and um, wove that into a basket. <clears throat> and it was something we had never really seen before. And as we started to research it, we, we realized that, um, that it, it was a completely new movement. And it was absolutely Navajo. It, ha it didn't reach out into the Apache culture or anything in the plains or the Great Basin. <clears throat> And so with the help of a young Navajo um, graphic artist named Damien Jim, we, we tightened the relationship, tightened the bond with the artists. And Damien began um, having conversations with the artists about different, different traditional stories, whether it was the stories uh, of related to the hero twins, Monster Slayer and Born for Water, who were the sons of Jonah A and Jonah A, the, the bearer of the sun. And depending on which story you read, either um, Changing Woman, who is also known as Mother Earth, and White Shell Woman, or just Changing, um, changing Woman. And now when, I, when, when we opened Twin Rocks, I remember reading the stories and, and finding that there was a lot of um, variation in the stories, so you'd read about Monster Slayer and Born for Water, and in one story, they would be the sons of Changing Woman, and in another story, Monster Slayer would be the son of Changing Woman, and Born for Water would be the son of White Shell Woman, and somehow they were twins. And what I came to realize is that that diversity was was the result of the Navajo culture being based on oral tradition. So one um, one individual would tell the story in one way and, and accentuate what was important to him or her, and then another might tell a completely different story. And it wasn't that one was wrong and one was right. It was really just the stories were very personal. <clears throat> so anyway, um, Adam has mentioned that all of you have a copy of Weaving a Revolution, which is a truly extraordinary book, in my opinion, um, published by the uh, Natural History Museum of Utah, and based on um, a collection of approximately 300 baskets that came from Twin Rocks Trading Post that chronicled the evolution of contemporary Navajo basketry almost from the very beginning, um, all the way up to that point, which was about 10 years ago, <clears throat> when, the, when the baskets were transferred to the Natural History Museum as part of a uh, part gift, part sale transaction. Um, and if you look through the, the, the pages of that book, you'll see um, uh, baskets that have stories about how the Navajo and the Apache separated, how, the, the, how males and females became um, angry with each other and moved across the river and then their activities spawned the monsters, which Monster Slayer and Born for Water then slew, um, uh, redeeming the Navajo people. Um, and this, some of the stories uh, represented in, those, in the baskets are just absolutely astounding. There are also a number of baskets that are based on just geometric themes, um, which are frankly my favorites. There's a basket in there um, by Elsie Holiday, which is called a dream basket, which I have one of those in my home, and that's probably my all-time favorite basket. But um, 
in any case, um, at the time that booklet was published, there was also an exhibition at the Natural History Museum of Utah, which again was just stunning, um, featuring about a third of the collection. Um, the, the baskets have evolved over time and um, they, they, there are, I'll just illustrate some of the contemporary baskets that we're working, that, that the artists are, have worked on. Um, and some of them are just classically funny. Some of them have um, deep cultural meaning. Um, some of them are just geometric. So, for example, this is one of my favorites. And you can see, um, it's kind of a crazy basket, but it has a big ribbon from the Gallup Intertribal Ceremonial last year. And I'm very proud of this basket because it's so far out of the main street. But the ribbon is also, uh, was awarded to the basket because it was the, the, the one piece in the entire um, ceremonial uh, art show that made people most happy. So anyway, that's, so that, that's a very important piece for me. Um, here's another piece by Elsie Holiday, which is an amazing butterfly piece, sort of based on fire themes, um, but again, just absolutely stunning. Um, <clears throat> and I hope those are coming through okay, Adam. Yeah. Okay, and then this one is more uh, in line with what we were talking about in terms of the cultural. This is what is um, referred to as a coyote star basket. And it's based on the story of Coyote, who's the trickster in Navajo mythology. And he, he plays all kinds of tricks on people. And, and um, through his chaos, the Navajo people learn valuable lessons. Um, and this one grows out of the story of how first man was very conscientiously placing stars in the sky. And he had um, placed a few of the constellations um, and he had all of the stars laid out on a buckskin. And Coyote then wandered into the process and said, hey, gee, first man, I, I'd like to help out. And first man, knowing Coyote's reputation, <laughs> didn't really want him involved. So uh, in order to pacify him, he gave him three stars to place in the skies. And those were red stars. And this actually is one of them. This, this represents one of those stars. Now, um, having placed the three stars in the sky, Coyote was not very satisfied with the job. So he took the buckskin shook it and blew all of the, the remaining stars up into the sky. And that's why we have the Milky Way. Um, so there are any number of coyote stories similar to that that are very interesting and, and, and very engaging. Um, I should back up for just a minute because Adam asked me early on a question about what, what is the role of trading posts in um, in native culture and um, what, what is most important to you as the owner of Twin Rocks Trading Post? Um, historically, as, as I mentioned, um, trading posts were really just centers of commerce. Um, the, 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 generally the Anglo trader set up a trading post and then um, the native people would come in and trade for flour and sugar and um, saddles and horse tack and that sort of thing. And as it evolved, arts and crafts became a very important element in the, um, in, in, in the process. Um, and the traders generally had a fair amount of influence on the artists and what the artists produced because they were buying it and then shipping it out to a broader, um, a broader market. So the traders realizing they had to sustain themselves and the artists realizing they had to sustain themselves, they worked very closely together on things that would sell to the broader market. And that's where you get what is commonly referred to 
has the trading post styles of rugs, which we all generally know, the two gray hills, the uh, ganado, the clagato, and, and those patterns are reflective of the kinds of relationships that were developed between the trader and the native artist. Um, at Ganado, for example, Lorenzo Hubbell knew he could sell red rugs and he liked the particular geomet the geometry of, of um, what was being done just over the hill at Two Great Hills. So he blended those two elements and you got the very geometric uh, double diamond or single diamond patterns of the Ganado rugs that came from his trading post in Ganado, Arizona. Um, so realizing that early on, um, we, we, we worked hard to develop close relationships with the artists. And we had, uh, you have to remember this was 30 years ago, so there was no such thing as the internet and, and copy machines were not broadly distribu distributed um, and certainly color copy machines were fairly rare. So we having access to more books and and magazines and manuals and that sort of thing, um, would just take the books off the shelf, whether it was uh, Oriental optical art or um, any number of, of other movements, um, abstract movements and show them to the weavers and say, you know, this is kind of an interesting um, area. It, it, is there, you know, do you have any ideas how we might incorporate this into your weavings? And it was amazing how open the artists were and how willing they were to, um, to, to try new things. And at the time, Barry, my brother, who has since retired from the business, and I um, made the commitment to just sort of open things up and buy every, <laughs> every Navajo basket we could afford, which practically bankrupted us. But in any case, uh, it was a really exciting time because the weavers were, were just doing all sorts of creative, imaginative things. And again, if you look, if you thumb through the book, Weaving a Revolution, you can see the dynamic uh, designs, you can see the diversity of color and pattern and, and all sorts of things. And you can also see um, some of the baskets we discussed that have deep um, cultural and historic meaning to the Navajo people. There are some in there that relate to, for example, to the Long Walk, a very dark time in Navajo history um, and a very painful time. There are some that are very um, happy and very, uh, very open, um, but also some that, that tend to be somewhat dark. Um, and it's always amazed me how different the artists interpreted um, and visualized uh, the, the different themes. So um, about, so the, the, the Weaving a Revolution book um, is actually uh, based on about the first 20 or 30 years of the contemporary Navajo basketry movement. And it really does begin at the beginning. There were a couple people who were involved um, who, who should get credit for starting the movement. There was a woman in um, uh, Old Jato, which is in Monument Valley, uh, that uh, her, and her name was Virginia Smith. Virginia died in the middle 1970s, I believe, in a tragic car accident. Um, but Virginia, having bought and sold countless ceremonial baskets, began to ask the weavers, can you do something different? Relatively simple question, but it spawned the beginning of a movement. Um, and the movement was very, very slow to get started. Bud Whiteford, who's published a, a very interesting book at about that time, recognized and, and referenced in his manual that, that something was going on in the Monument Valley, Old Jato area, but he didn't really know what it was and he didn't know how it was going to involve, evolve. And at the same time, Barry, whom I mentioned, um, and my father um, were in Blanding at, 
Blue Mountain Trading Post asking the local weavers to do different things. And, and they were sort of starting to, um, to innovate and starting to, to be a little more creative. And then Twin Rocks was opened in 1989. And um, at that time, Barry and I made the full on commitment to do all we can, all we could do to support the local basket weavers and to just generally see what might happen. And um, the, the basketry, the baskets that came in at the time were stunning. It, it was so exciting to come to work because you never knew what was going to come in and the weavers kind of got in the habit of keeping the baskets under their, their jackets or in a, in a cloth so that they could unveil them to us and see our, our reaction, which partially influenced <laughs> how much money they got paid, but also just they really enjoyed um, uh, seeing how much we enjoyed their, their latest creation. Um, uh, after 2000, uh, after the, the tech burst bubble in 2000, after the tech bubble burst in 2000, um, things tightened up for the for Twin Rocks Trading Post and for the local weavers. Um, but the but the movement continued until 2008, which was truly catastrophic for the local weavers because, uh, similar to what we're experiencing right now, the market completely dried up. <clears throat> but there were a few weavers who didn't migrate off to other, um, other professions or other endeavors, and they kept weaving and we kept supporting as much as we possibly could. And we had the idea at the time to um, fill the space above our windows, which look out onto the small town of Bluff. And, uh, and the space above the windows is about 14 inches. So we encouraged the weavers to do ceremonial baskets. So again, this is the ceremonial basket pattern, to do variations on that particular theme. And we wound up getting about 75 to 80 um, really interesting things that, that were some sort of folk arty and some very serious and some very artistic. And that collection, again, wound up at the Natural History Museum um, of Utah, uh, along with another collection of historic ceremonial baskets that um, encompassed almost 200 pieces. So at this point, in my estimation, and I'm sure that this is consistent with virtually any um, Southwest uh, basket expert, uh, expert's opinion, would, would say that the Natural History Museum of Utah has the very best historic and contemporary Navajo basket collection, I would say in the world, um, certainly in the United States, and I can't think of a single one that would be um, comparable anywhere else. Um, so, um, <laughs> for the last couple of years after we transferred that collection to the Natural History Museum, we've been wondering what, what, should, what can we do to um, start uh, the, what we refer to as the window collection phase two. Um, and over time, what has evolved is that the local we weavers are very interested in, have become very interested in abstract black and white imagery. So we've started to get, again, some amazing weavings. The, the movement, which is just barely getting started, began with this. And this, <laughs> this is what we refer to as the splat basket. Um, because as you can see, it's just completely and absolutely abstract and it looks like somebody just threw something on the wall and, and there you have it. But in terms of creativity, I think it's nothing short of amazing. Um, this was woven by uh, Master Weaver Joanne Johnson, who is the um, niece of Peggy Rockblack, who will be your um, lecture during um, the uh, weaving seminar when it's rescheduled. Um, out of this one, <clears throat> K. 
came this. Um, and this is the black hole basket. Now, Adam mentioned that um, my daughter, Kara, is an astrophysicist. So this one, <laughs> and she's very interested in um, black holes. She's, she has her undergraduate degree and she's presently applying for PhD programs. Um, and we'll see how that goes. But anyway, so this being the black hole basket, which is something she's very interested in and something that she's done a fair amount of research on is very meaningful for me. Um, so uh, getting back to Peggy Black, who will be your teacher, this is, this is her, one of her designs for the, the phase two basket collection. And there's another. And you can see that um, Peggy's a very, very good technician. Um, she's an extremely good artist. She does great materials preparation. Um, and her basketry is beautiful. Here's one. Here are a couple more by a woman named Alicia Nelson. This is one we call the boom boomerang basket. Um, but I think the simplicity and the execution of this is stunning and it, it really comes off nice. Um, Alicia's, uh, I think, Alicia really loves black and white designs. And again, her materials preparation and the quality of the weave is superb. Um, there's another one here, which I need to find. Um, not sure what I've done with it. Oh, here it is. Okay, this one is one of the latest ones by Joanne Johnson. Um, and this will probably turn out to be one of a two-part series. So these are, this, this is called the Manuments or um, could be the woman humans, but anyway, man-made monuments. And then Joanne's going to do a second one, I believe, with the monuments of Monument Valley. So uh, you can see the creativity in the local uh, basket weavers. Uh, just keeps growing and expanding, and, and they seem to, to feel absolute freedom to just create um, whatever's in their mind, which is truly exciting for me. Um, and fortunately has been exciting enough uh, for our customers to keep um, the movement going forward. Um, at this time, you know, I'm willing to open it up for questions if anybody has any. Uh, if there's another direction you'd like to take the conversation, I'm happy to go that way. So, Adam, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, wow, Steve, those baskets are wonderful. Thank you for sharing those. They're stunning, um, aren't they? Oh, they truly are. Um, I have a couple questions here. Uh, how are the artists achieving the different colors in the dyes? And, and do, do you have any insight on that? I do, actually. And, and it's something, again, we've worked very closely with the artists um, on over the years. Um, the, the dyes are fabric dyes. Um, and sumac tends to be, sumac, which is a woody plant, um, tends to be a little bit waxy. So it's very hard to get the dyes to penetrate and to be stable. So over the years, we've experimented with any number of things, including um, some of the traditional dyes of uh, indigo and cochineal and, um, and natural plant dyes, which again, tend to be a little unstable. Um, we've also experimented with wood stain, which doesn't seem to work because it doesn't penetrate the uh, sumac well enough. So the artist used the, those little boxes of writ dye and it, it works fabulously and, and they get a whole rainbow of colors and um, the, the dyes are very stable, so they last in the long term. Awesome, that's, that's really neat, okay. Um, and then another question would be, um, to what extent is the art of weaving being passed down to the next generation? 
Well, again, Adam, I think that's an excellent question. And unfortunately, the answer is not a lot. Um, the, the economic cycles that we've experienced over the past several years has done a great deal of damage to this particular movement. Um, as I said, in, in 2008, during the Great Recession, um, people stopped buying artwork to a large extent, and so the, the market constricted significantly. We made a commitment to the artists to continue to buy and, and, and allow them to continue to innovate and, and develop their art, but it was a true struggle. <laughs> um, and it, it may turn out to be nothing compared to what we're presently dealing with, with the coronavirus and the spread of, of, uh, of the illness across the Navajo Nation and across the, 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 the United States and the world in general. Um, we're just at the beginning of that movement, as you know, or, uh, or that infection, as you know. Um, but the Navajo Nation is presently quarantined. So at the trade, the trading post is closed um, uh, under the order of the town of Bluff um, and the Navajo Nation is quarantined. And so we're not seeing the artists um, except that the, the Twin Rocks Cafe, which we also own um, is preparing and sending, helping to prepare and send out um, food baskets to some of the people who are frankly in desperate need. Um, so we do have contact with the artists, but um, it's not nearly as close as it was before the quarantine. Um, and we're worried a great deal, so. Is, is there something that uh, I and Crow Canyon and, and our viewers can do to help uh, the artists for the Navajo Nation? You know, Adam, probably the best thing for me to do, there's a, there, there's a group of young people who are high energy and extremely intelligent here in Bluff who go by the name of the Bluff Mutual Aid Society. And they are um, the, the primary movers right now behind um, getting food out to people in Bluff. And they're, they're working out of the um, deserted um, dining rooms of Twin Rocks Cafe. Um, so they're, they're right next door um, and they're doing a great job. So probably what I need to do is just email you um, the, the contact information for, for the, uh, the people who are heading that up and then you can get it out to your viewers um, and they can talk to um, Dan Myers or, um, uh, well, Dan, I think Dan is, is one of the primary individuals to speak with about how um, they can help, how your, your, um, your viewers can help. Thanks, Steve. That's awesome. Uh, I will certainly um, forward that information. Um, would you be willing to talk about contemporary Navajo basket weaving in relation to contemporary basket weaving in other indigenous communities? Um, yeah, I, I will admit that um, my knowledge of outside basketry is somewhat limited, and that's partially because, or mostly because, there's not a great deal of basketry being done outside of the Southwest. And I don't know if you've ever seen the, um, the, the information about the quilters of G's Bend. Um, quilters who do stunning, ab I mean, just, just amazing um, quilts that are um, geometric to a large extent. Um, but it's a very small, very regional movement. Um, and the, the contemporary Navajo basketry movement is also very small and very regional. Um, there are really only a handful of basket weavers who are actively producing right now. Um, and, and, and all of those are weavers that we, that, that we work with on a regular basis. Um, but when you spread it out into the Great Basin or into the East or the South um, or the West Coast, there's just not a lot happening in, in contemporary basketry. You find, um, in my experience, that, the, that some of these historic movements catch on in contemporary uh, uh, movements, but they don't grow very, very well and they don't seem to last very long. That's one of the interesting things about contemporary Navajo basketry is it, it really is dynamic. And 
although we've lost a number of weavers over the years to these um, economic cycles, because it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and while the weavers can make um, reasonably good money, it takes time to harvest the materials, to prepare them, to dye them, to weave them. Um, and um, without, without, an, without something like Twin Rocks Trading Post, there's no incentive really to, um, to innovate because if you put all that time into a basket and then you take it out to some of the other trading posts and they say, oh, well, gee, you know, we know we can sell ceremonial baskets, but we don't really know about these. And by the way, they're a little more expensive than what we're accustomed to paying. Um, uh, the, the weavers simply can't afford to take that chance. So, the, so it stifles creativity. <clears throat> and that's what I think we do best. And that's what I feel is most important about what we do at Twin Rocks. And that is we open up the creativity and we give the weavers an avenue to just do what they, what they see, what, what they envision, what they, you know, how they view the world. And that's why, <laughs> that's why I think a basket like this is so important is that, you know, this is the experience that Joanne Johnson was having at this particular time. You know, maybe she was in Salt Lake or maybe she was somewhere else. She's um, very intelligent and, and experienced and, and she moves around a fair amount, <clears throat> but she lives in Monument Valley. So, you know, the, the complement to this will be Monument Valley. So you get that dichotomy, um, which I think is really reflective of the world in which they live, very traditional but also moving into the, you know, contemporary Anglo society, if you will, <clears throat> and trying to navigate those two different spheres. So this is the kind of thing that I get really excited about. Um, I also get very excited about baskets like this because they're just simple design and beautiful execution. Um, and and the weavers are going to make a you know relatively good living weaving baskets like this. Let me just be a little crass for a moment. So this basket would retail for about two thousand dollars, which means that the basket weaver gets a, a good compensation for doing a piece like this, and that's very important um, in terms of moving the the art forward, keep of, of continuing this dynamic. Um, movement and and making sure that the weavers do well the art progresses and everything moves forward i i mean we hear a lot about sustainability these days and i as far as i'm concerned we need to move past sustainability and move in certainly with the people i like to deal with at twin rocks and move into something that's that that is not just static but really dynamic, that's moving, that's changing, that creates new opportunities, that creates new visions. That's what I like most. And, and again, you know, talking to the weavers, and, and well, talking to the weavers, what you get is this really interesting intersection of traditional values, but also some really good innovation. So there, there's that intersection of innovation and tradition that, um, I feel makes this um, extremely interesting. And I, and I feel, I mentioned the G's Bend quilters. I feel there, there are a lot of parallels because you're dealing with an isolated population doing something that's really unusual um, that, that a, lot of, a lot of the world just has not seen and doesn't understand yet. Hopefully they will at some point. Steve, uh, so... You know, just as an estimate, how many hours would a weaver put into something like that boomerang basket? Um, it's really, uh, it's really a difficult um, calculation to make because <clears throat> to start, the weavers have to go out and collect the material, and that can take um, many several days, depending on, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on what time of year it is, um, depending on what kind of access they have um, to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to the sumac. Um, then, you know, once they harvest it, um, 
take it back home, and they began the process of splitting, <clears throat> excuse me, splitting the sumac, um, and and then you know they uh, traditionally what they would do is pull it through a tin can to make the um, what would be the weft, um, the outer what you see in the basketry. You've got in it, in essence these are textiles. So you've got the warp inside and then the weft over. So if we talk about it in those terms, the, the, the weft, um, they would pull it through a tin can to make it more symmetrical. And people who've done this kind of weaving realize, or people who've been exposed to this kind of weaving realize that much of this is in the, in the materials preparation. And that takes a long time. You don't, if you don't prepare your materials properly, then your basket tends to be, um, um more inconsistent um so then once the materials are are prepared and this is just a small sampling of what the material looks like once it's prepared i don't know if you can see that very well um but um then you dye the then you dye the splits um and then you start weaving um and depending on the design it could take a week, it could take two weeks, it could take a month. Um, I'm just going to guess that uh, a basket like this would take about a month to weave, you know, including the harvesting and dyeing and all of that. Um, and that's working, um, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 hours a week because it really is tedious work and, and um, it varies a great deal from weaver to weaver. Some weavers are very fast, some weavers are very slow. And um, as, as you ask, you know, is the next generation um, picking, it, picking this up? And the answer is clearly no. Um, a lot of these weavers <clears throat> are my age, I'm 60 years old, so not my age and, you know, maybe 10 years younger. So that that population is beginning to age out. They're also beginning to have, you know, diminished vision. So Elsie Holiday, for example, comes in with her reading glasses on so she can, you know, so she can see designs and, and, and weave them. Um, and then hand strength is a big issue. Um, as we get older and our hands become less strong or more arthritic, um, it's harder to weave. So the, the answer to your question is, it's really difficult to know. Um, and it varies a great deal from weaver to weaver. Thank you, Steve. That's, that's yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there's one thing I learned in the process in developing this uh, travel seminar with you and Jessica and Tufel, Handcraft to Travel, is that it, it takes an amazing amount of time. I've learned that through Peggy. Um, an, ex an extraordinary process. amount of time, yeah. Uh, and it's like all crafts, um, unfortunately, is that the, the basket weavers or the quilters or the, the um, folk art carvers are never really adequately compensated in, in contemporary Anglo terms of, of payment. Okay. Um, I have a question about your clientele. Um, do you uh, mostly sell to uh, dedicated collectors? Well, Again, <clears throat> we have a little different philosophy at Twin Rocks Trading Post. Um, we decided years ago that we don't want to sell things that people just come buy and then throw in the closet whenever they get home from their trips. And they, we, we like to sell items that are more meaningful, that are lasting, that um, people enjoy for many, many years. And, and I know in my home, I have a lot of rugs and baskets and every time I walk past them and look at them, they make me happy. And that's the response I want from my clientele. So um, we sell a higher end um, item. And, and that also helps us raise the, 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 the personal economies of, of the individual weavers as well. Um, so we do have um, a, a dedicated clientele of collectors who've been with us for many, many years. Um, as I said, Twin Rocks has been open 30 years. And before that, um, Blue Mountain Trading Post, which was our other trading post, um, was open 20 years. So altogether, you know, close to 50 years in, in this particular industry. Thanks, Steve. 
Um, would you be willing to comment on innovations and developments in other Navajo crafts? Um, yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I think so. Um, I, I think there is the, the Navajo people in general, and maybe I'll stereotype just a little bit, but I, I think it's a positive stereotype. The Navajo people in general tend to be very open to new ideas and, and they, they tend to um, evolve fairly quickly. I think that's been part of their success over the years. As, as most of us know, they are the largest tribe in terms of population and land base in the US. Um, but if you look at jewelry, for example, <laughs> there, there are, um, there's just extraordinary innovation going on and, and weavers or, or um, jewelers involved in all sorts of things. I think you find that in rug weaving, rug and blanket weaving to uh, maybe a more limited extent, but certainly there are some uh, new rug movements that I've seen over the years that just completely knocked me out. Um, Barry and I did a, um, uh, a show in New York City many years ago called um, Changing Hands, Art Without Reservations, Art Without Reservation. Um, and the theme was contemporary or, or art that's created by Native American artists but art that transcends cultural boundaries. And there was so much good stuff there. And of course, this was 20 years ago, and there's been at least 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago. Um, and there's been so much innovation. Um, you know, when, when I was a young man, and Charles Laloma, for example, was, was beginning to do jewelry, um, and everybody looked at it and thought, hmm, that's different. And I, 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 you know, I wonder if that's going to catch hold. And I, I, you know, it's not truly Native American, is it? And, and of course it was. Um, but you see what's happened there. And, and that is, again, something that truly excites me when I see these new movements. Um, and when I see the contemporary Navajo basket weavers, catching on to something like abstract black and white designs and 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 doing things that i've never seen before and i've and i've seen probably the bulk of contemporary navajo basketry and it's very exciting to me and i hope it's exciting to people in the outside world as well yeah i certainly do enjoy uh, visiting your gallery and, and checking out the really neat things you have on display the beautiful pieces of art uh, I have a question here uh, about, uh, we have a viewer that's curious about the impact of, and the current situation uh, that we have with COVID-19 and, and uh, how are the artists weathering? Do you know how they're weathering the lack of tourism and the current curfew they're under? I, I think it's early in the, in, in the infection and it's difficult to quantify, but I think the impact is, is already um, significant and, and may very well be huge. Um, as I said, because everything just closed so quickly, the trading post has been closed um, for about a week and a half. So really at the beginning of, of the infection, um, of the United States infection. Um, and while I'm here every day, I, I don't, I, I'm amazed that I don't get as many calls as I would expect from Weaver saying, hey, we need a little help because we're always there to help if we can. Um, uh, I know because my wife is working with the food distribution channels that there is great need out on the reservation. And, and luckily there are organizations like the Bluff Mutual Aid Society and, and, um, uh, and other uh, entities that are working hard to get um, food and supplies out to uh, the people who are in need. But I, I am a bit surprised that I haven't heard more from the artists. And I don't, I'm, I can't really explain why, because I certainly expected to, um, but I, I, I haven't. And, I, and I, I, I'm certainly greatly concerned that they're struggling mightily. Um, but I don't know. And, and what the long-term impact is going to be, again, I think it's hard to quantify because nobody knows, and I certainly don't know, how long this is going to last. My suspicion is it's going to last 
a very long time, meaning that, you know, probably through the summer and, and into the fall before we get some sort of resolution. And by that time, a lot of people are, are going to be in difficult circumstances. I'm sure you're right, Steve. It's probably too early to tell. Um, it, I have another question here that asks uh, if you, Twin Rock sells directly to the public and is it possible uh, to shop in your store while we're sitting on it, on our couch at home? Yeah, yeah we, do, we do have a website called um, twinrocks.com. That's relatively easy. Um, and probably 90% of our inventory is online. So you can shop online with us. And as I said, we're, we're here every day even though the businesses are closed, um, we're still taking calls and talking with people um, through email. And um, you can reach me at steve at twinrocks.com. Um, and I'm pretty good about responding quickly. Um, <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I'm sort of short of things to do since, <laughs> since it's quiet around here. Um, but yes, people can, can, can still contact us. Thanks. Um, Steve, what do you love about Bluff and the Four Corners area? And, and if you don't mind, what makes your area special? <clears throat> well, I've, I've mentioned uh, the word or the term freedom um, a number of times with respect to the artists and, and allowing them the freedom to, to innovate and to use their creativity um, and not be stifled by me or anybody else saying, oh, well, you know, just, just do what you've done in the past. And what I've enjoyed most over the years is the freedom um, that I've seen my children express uh, living in an area like this. Bluff is a town of 250 people approximately. So my kids just grew up wild and free. And it's amazing to me that they've wound up in um, professions like astrophysics or biomedical engineering. Um, but in a way, it sort of makes sense because they've had the independence to explore all sorts of things. And their, their mother, my wife, is, um, is, uh, has, has been deeply, we've both been deeply involved in their education, but um, Jana, my wife, took them out of school many years ago and just traveled them around the, the US and showed them different things. And I think it gave them a love of this small town and it gave them a love of, of ex exploration and, and um, uh, anyway, just really set them free. So if I, if I think probably the most important term to me is that, that freedom and that independence, and I think you can find that in a town like Bluff. I absolutely agree. Steve, thank you so much for your time. We were really grateful for you opening up your gallery and I really appreciate the work you're doing in the world to you know, help support the arts and, and your fellow human being and I'm, I'm grateful, thank you. Um, you're welcome and thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about something that, we, that I really love. Awesome. Uh, so thanks for hosting the, the, our webinar, and thanks also to Jessica Warner of Twofold Handcrafted Travel for keeping us all connected. Um, thanks to all of you for participating and asking questions this morning. Um, please stay in touch with uh, with Crow Canyon, uh, with Trin, uh, excuse me, Twin Rocks Trading Post at TwinRocks.com, uh, Twofold Handcrafted Travel at TwofoldTravel.com, and Crow Canyon website, uh, CrowCanyon.org. Um, until next time, we wish you and all your loved ones good health in the comfort of your home. Thank you. And we hope to see you at Twin Rocks Trading Post in the not too distant future. Thank you. Here, here. <clears throat>